Well, good morning, Allen Bible. How's everybody doing? I'm good. I would love to invite you to stand, and uh, before we sing, I just would love to call us to worship, and I just want us to read, um, or I'm just going to read for us uh, the very end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7. And this is how Jesus ends his sermon uh, as we kind of journey through this. I think this is a great way to just be reminded of this is where Jesus, where Jesus is going. It says, therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell and the rivers rose and the winds blew and pounded that house. Yet it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded the house and it collapsed. And it collapsed with a great crash. And so when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching because he was teaching them like one who had authority and not like their scribes. Um, so right now we're going to sing about uh, just Christ being the foundation for our life. And so I think as, as, we, as we listen to the Sermon on the Mount, what Jesus has for us, the, the wisdom that he has for us, I just think it's a great thing to just pray, God, would you teach us this morning? Um, and just as we worship you this morning, uh, that you would just be honored and glorified with, by the words that we sing. So we we'll to invite you to sing with us. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, with everything around me shaking, and I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, he's never left me down. So why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. And I still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going.
together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we acknowledge you as the God that never changes. And as we have just sung, Lord, we acknowledge you the God, as the God that will never fail us. And so, Lord, we are here to worship you for who you are and for what you've done this morning. And may our worship be pleasing to you. We give you all praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, please be seated. And as you're seated, let me uh, say a couple quick things to you this morning. One is if you are visiting with us or you've been here for just a few weeks and you're not fully connected yet, uh, we would ask you to scan the QR code, which is on your screen and is also in the seat backs in front of you. And if you're not familiar with what that is, you just open up your camera app, point it at it, It'll, a link will pop up and you push that and boom, there you are. You can type in your information. We'd love to let you know a little bit more about our church. Um, yeah, so we're just thrilled that you're here. And if you're part of our church family, we always want to encourage our, us to give back to the Lord what he has given to us. And you can do that either here in the box uh, by the back door there or online um, or through the mail. So let's, we continue as a church family to grow together uh, in that regard. Uh, a couple quick announcements is uh, to, uh, tomorrow, right, is a young adults, uh, let's see if it come up there. It's a young adults, uh, yeah, yeah, right there. Tomorrow, 7 p.m., right there's your information. So if you identify as a young adult, it's for you, all right? Uh, there's your information, and show up there and, and have a great time with that. Also on July the 14th is Baptism Sunday. And, man, that is a great great opportunity for us as a church body here on a Sunday morning to celebrate those who would proclaim publicly that they have already moved from death to life, and baptism is the scriptural, um, it's the biblical picture of that. So if you're interested in being baptized, uh, you go on, our, you, yeah, there you go, there's a, you scan that right there, open your camera app, scan that, or go online, and uh, we'd love to have a conversation with you about that. Um, yeah, that's it, I think, for this morning announcements. Well, we're going to transition right now to a time of taking the Lord's Supper together, uh, and one of our elders here is Kyle Felker, and he's going to come lead us uh, to that end. Good morning. As as he said, I'm Kyle Felker. I'm one of the elders. I also have the honor of uh, leading a life group along with the Clarks. Um, we're going to move into a time of the Lord's Supper. Um, if you haven't gotten your little uh, cracker and juice, there are still some in the back. If you need to slide back there and grab one real quick. Um, when we take the Lord's Supper here at Allen Bible, um, it's the Lord's table. It's not our table. 
So if you are a believer in Jesus Christ and you're visiting with us today, feel free to partake. Um, if you have not placed your faith in Jesus um, and you're visiting here today, we ask that you would uh, not take the elements and maybe just have a conversation with whoever you're here with or with one of our staff or one of our members and just what this means. Um, I would like to read from Mark 14. Hang on. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave to them, and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to him, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So as we take these elements, we remember the blood and the body of Jesus Christ who sacrificed for us. You may have come into this service today having a great week or a terrible week. You may be struggling. You may be feeling particularly close to the Lord. But all of us need the body and blood of Jesus Christ. This is his promise to us of our hope for salvation. And we remember that and we celebrate that when we take the Lord's table together. So right now the band is going to play, and uh, I just ask that if you need to do business with the Lord, a moment of prayer or reflection, please go ahead and do that. And then when you are ready, go ahead and take uh, the bread and the cup, and then when they're done, I'll come back up and I'll pray.
for this opportunity to celebrate and remember that you sacrificed and came to save us. Lord, help us to live into this, to remember it day by day. And Lord, I pray that your peace would go forward with us. In your name I pray. Amen. At this time, kids up through fourth grade are dismissed, and we're going to continue with the worship.
the cross brings transformation And I'll be crucified with you Cause death is just a doorway into resurrection life And if I join you in your suffering Then I'll join you when you rise And when you return in glory With all the angels and the saints My heart will still be singing My song will be the same Sing it all Christ be magnified And let His praise arise Christ be magnified in the doorway to resurrection life and if I join you in your suffering then I'll join you when you rise and with you return in glory with all the angels and the saints my heart will still be singing my soul will be the same sing it all Christ be be magnified in me. Sing it all. Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, just, uh, this morning that is our prayer. God, that your son Jesus Christ would be magnified uh, just in every um, aspect of our life. Uh, through how we relate to, to people at work, um, through our family, um, through just how we go about daily life, God, that you would uh, just receive honor and glory through how we live and that we would give it all glory to you, God. And so. Father, we thank you for this morning that we can just dive back into the Sermon on the Mount and just uh, just learn what you have for us this morning. So, Father, we love you. We trust you. Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Um, I'm just adding my word of greeting uh, to those you've already heard in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Glad you're here worshiping with us. My name is Buddy Lyles. I serve as one of the pastors here. And I get uh, kind of a two-pronged privilege. Uh, I get to introduce our uh, preacher, um, Bob Deffenbaugh, and I will do that <clears throat> now. And then actually going to one more thing to lead us in prayer with our four, and then we'll bring Bob up. Um, so uh, Bob Deffenbaugh is, uh, if, you, if you Google, like you're like, man, I'm really studying this passage of the Bible, uh, oftentimes it will pop up Bible.org, and it'll be one of his sermons for years and years and years, almost 40 or 40 years at Community Bible Chapel. Yeah, he's gone all over the world um, doing uh, evangelism, pastoral training, you name it, under the sun. Uh, he's done it. But probably um, the greatest thing for us is he's a friend of Allen Bible, and he's the father of Jenny Felker. And so uh, that's how we get to have um, just the privilege of, of hearing from him. And so, uh, as one like that, we gave him the toughest parts of the Sermon on the Mount uh, to come <laughs> preach. So, the next two weeks, uh, he'll be, uh, be doing that. Uh, if you're newer with us, our vision as a church uh, is to live deployed as Christ ambassadors among our neighbors, the nations, and the next generation, however he's wired us and wherever he locates us. And so, I'm, I'm emphasizing that because as we seek to apply God's Word and Christ being the foundation of our life, it's, it's a foundation, it's a rootedness, but he also intends not just to be a house, but to be his ambassadors, to be on the move, strengthened by who he is. And that phrase, live deployed, that means wherever you go tomorrow, live deployed there, you're sent there. I use that language very intentionally because one of our uh, students who just graduated high school, Carson Gant, is actually going to understand live deployed from the way we most often understand it. Uh, he is about to go to the military. I asked him to give me a quick sentence, so I'm just going to read it. Uh, he is going to join the Army. 
Uh, it's today he leaves, which is why we're doing this. Um, of become, his goal ultimately is to be um, an airborne ranger with the Army, and he'll be leaving this evening, shipping out to Fort Moore tomorrow morning to start basic training. So some of you live that, so you know how to pray for him better than I do. But I just want to uh, take a moment and lift you up, Carson. Uh, we love you. We're so glad that you've been part of our student ministry uh, for a time. And we want to send you out to our part uh, in that way. And I'll also pray for Bob. Let's pray. Lord, uh, grateful for the opportunity to sing your praises. You do inhabit the praise of your people. I pray that our affections would follow the attention we're trying to give you this morning. And especially we want to lift up uh, Carson. Thank you for him. And uh, just <clears throat> look forward to hearing uh, how you answer our prayers for him. And we know that you can do more than we know how to ask or imagine for him. But, Lord, for him to step into something that is immediately going to be confronted with what does authority mean and what does submission to authority mean and what does it mean to serve and to sacrifice. And so we thank you that he is willingly stepping into that. Uh, we pray that he would be your ambassador uh, among uh, folks there in that world. It could often be um, a little bit hostile toward uh, faith. But also, Lord, we know and we pray that you would help him to find uh, not just a chaplain, but maybe a few other guys in his, his class going in here that, that um, are followers of Christ that could be sources of encouragement, strength, and friendship. And so go before him uh, and bless him to be a blessing to others. Give him strength for the task. Give him endurance to endure what basic training and beyond will require. And I, I thank you for his willingness to, to put his life on the line, uh, to sacrifice and to serve our country so that the freedoms we enjoy, Lord, he will be a part of helping that continue. We thank you for Bob Deffenbaugh. Pray for him as he comes now. Um, open our hearts to be attentive to your word as he brings it, as you've laid it on his heart as he's observed it um, from Matthew's gospel. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's welcome Bob Deffenbaugh. Thank you, buddy. I assume I'm, I can even hear myself. I must be hot on that mic. There's a fellow named Pat Boone. I suspect probably most everybody in this audience doesn't even know who he is. He's so old. But he was a, a musician and, and, and a believer. And I remember years ago hearing him describe his sense of heaven as a child. He was sitting in church and he was listening to a rather boring sermon. And he said to himself, a thousand years 10,000 years. <laughs> to him, heaven was just one long, boring sermon. Well, I have to tell you, the sermon we're dealing with is far from boring. I've, sh I I've preached my share of boring sermons over the years. I know what those are about. This one is a bombshell. But we don't automatically tend to see that when we think in terms of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is actually one of those sermons that unbelievers really like. It's sort of like a Christian version of how to win friends and influence people. Uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, the Lord's Prayer. Eh, that's kind of nice. And, and then the big one is judge not. Ooh, that's a popular one amongst the unbelieving world. They like this sermon. The only problem is they don't get it. They cherry pick it with a few things that sound good, but they miss the point of this sermon. I know there are a lot, I, I suppose the most popular way of dealing with this in evangelical circles is to talk about how to live in, in, a, in an unbelieving world, how to impact our culture, there's an element of truth there, and I'm not trying to resist that, but it's not the core, in my opinion, of what this text is about. And, and then there are some friends of mine who I'm not going to name at this point, but, but basically they, they really gut this sermon by saying these are not things Jesus is saying about the here and now. These are things 
that relate to the kingdom that's coming. Man, it's hard to make this sermon very applicable if you've concluded it isn't for you. Well, I don't buy that. When you look at this, this is a sermon that Jesus is delivering that will rock the theological world of his day. Interestingly, Matthew stays away from the reaction of, of, of the crowd and especially of the Jewish religious leaders because he doesn't want us to focus on that. Jesus is speaking to his disciples, but he's speaking to them about a heresy that can send them and others to hell. And that heresy is being taught by the Jewish religious leaders. I, I was at a conference some years ago, and, and uh, John Piper was speaking, but the, the, the keynote speaker was Chuck Colson. And he preached a sermon that went like this, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. That yeah, was a great, great sounding sermon. And, and uh, I didn't think about it too much, but it was really focusing on duty. I'm obligated to live out this life. And there's an element of truth to that. Next morning, John Piper comes in, first time at a Ligonier's conference, and he, he sort of hems and haws a little bit, and then he says, well, all right, I'm just going to say it. Colson was wrong. <laughs> you, you should... You should have seen the, the audience. It was like, whoa, what is this? I never saw a guy defend himself so well as John Piper. He was a machine gun artist with scripture. But I think the reality is Colson and Piper had a point. They just needed to get together on that. Our duty should be our delight. I think that's the essence of it. Whatever the reaction of that crowd was, multiply it by at least 10. Because when you get to verse 20, <laughs> here's this crowd, at the this, this sermon and, and whatever, and, and Jesus says, oh, by the way, unless your righteousness is better than the scribes and the Pharisees, you're not going to get to heaven. And, and I can see some guy poking the guy next to him and say, did he just say they're going to hell? He did. He did. He said your religious leaders are teaching what's damnable. Woo-hoo! That ought to put the crowd on edge, right? Now they're going to be really listening to what's happening. I'm saying this is a bombshell sermon. It doesn't tell you how to get to heaven but it does tell you what won't get you there. And at this stage in the gospel, that's really important. Now, I want to go back to those verses in, in chapter, at the end of chapter 4, that describe the, the setting of what's going on. And I want to talk, first of all, about the crowd. It's clear from what Matthew tells us that Jesus is doing two things. He's preaching... And he's healing. But when you add the element from Luke's gospel uh, and the parallel account in Luke chapter 6, Jesus is literally healing all kinds of things, delivering from demons, every kind of sickness and whatever. And so a lot of those people, I don't want to say sadly, but a lot of those people are there not to hear a sermon they're here to get a healing, right? And in fact, it says the people would try to just touch Jesus. Can you imagine what it was like to have Jesus start teaching and people are sneaking up, trying to grab a hold, get a little piece of healing from him? And, and in the midst of this, many of Jesus' miracles were in the midst of his teaching. So somebody, in effect, would, would interrupt him. He would heal them, and then he would get back to his sermon. Well, I got to say, you know, people say when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. When Jesus spoke, people listened. Because when he could say to somebody who has a terminal illness, you're healed, and they are in front of everybody while you're speaking. I love, I'm glad you read those last verses, especially the last verse. 
he preaches, he speaks as one who has authority and not as the scribes. <laughs> Boy, if I was a scribe sitting there and I heard the guy next to me say that, I wouldn't be too happy. But everybody realized Jesus' words had weight because when he spoke, it happened. And that certainly distinguished him from the religious leaders. So anyway, you've got the crowds who are there seeking a healing. You've got Jesus who has done everything wrong. Uh, if he had a publicity guy, Jesus did everything wrong. He started his ministry in Galilee of the Gentiles. And, and you know, there's other texts. Remember uh, John chapter 7 when Nicodemus says, well, don't we give Jesus due process? And, and the religious leaders said, are you as stupid as the crowds who don't know the law? Do you come from Galilee too? I mean, if you were from Galilee, you were a hick. And, and in fact, your voice gave you away. What did they say to Peter? Yeah, I could tell. Listen to you. You're a, you're a Galilean. That wasn't a compliment, folks. Jesus started his ministry in an obscure place. He, he identified himself with John the Baptist, who was an obscure guy out in the wilderness. He deliberately avoided uh, all of the, 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 the Jerusalem stuff. And remember Jesus' brothers said to him in John chapter 7, Jesus, if you're gonna if you're gonna start this ministry and you're gonna go out and you're gonna gather the crowds, you gotta go to Jerusalem. That's where it all happens. It's like saying you gotta go to New York City. Well, Jesus didn't. He did everything wrong, so to speak. He wasn't educated in their schools. He didn't seek their support. He picked guys who, who were not the the intellectual elite, his disciples. I don't think were the sharpest tools uh, in the drawer. He did everything wrong, it seemed. And yet what happens? Jesus' ministry flourishes. Thank you. I said I didn't need water, and I guess I did. Anyway, here's Jesus, in effect, kind of doing everything wrong, and yet here are these crowds that are gathering from all over, including Jerusalem. And then you get the opposition. They have been concerned about Jesus from the day he was born. Remember in Matthew, the account, when, the, when the, the wise guys came up and they came to Jerusalem and they said, where is the one who's born king of the Jews? It says, all Jerusalem was greatly troubled. <laughs> it's like going to Washington, D.C., to the White House and saying, where's that new presidential candidate that's going to win? Man, there's going to be a lot of uneasy people hearing that. So Jesus really put the religious leaders on edge, and he did things which troubled them. He associated with sinners. That wasn't so good. He didn't seem to be eager to associate with them. He said he was doing the Father's work, making himself equal with God. And the big one was he violated the Sabbath, in their, in their opinion. Side note, I find it interesting that the biggest issue the religious leaders have with Jesus isn't mentioned in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus stays away from the Sabbath, and he deals with this issue in some other way, I think, so that it isn't quite as explosive at that moment in time. So here's Jesus coming and speaking as he does with his great authority. And then there's the disciples. Hey, these guys, these guys are really something. But I think we make a mistake when we read Matthew chapter 5. We read it like we're reading Acts chapter 2. The disciples don't know the gospel. You get that? The disciples don't know the gospel. Neither does anyone else. Okay, so we get all the way to Matthew chapter 16, and Jesus says to them, well, uh, what do men say? Who do men say that I am? Oh, you're the prophet, so and so. Well, who do you say that I am? Well, Peter says, you're the Messiah. And Jesus then says, you're absolutely right. And by the way, what that means is, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, and I'm going to suffer, and I'm going to die. What does Peter say? Oh, that's great. That's such a wonderful gospel message. 
he whacks Jesus on the shoulder and said, you're nuts. You're not going to go there. That's crazy talk. He didn't know the gospel. All the way to the end, they're saying, well, is the kingdom going to come now? What's it going to be like? They don't, didn't know. See, what we celebrated in that communion uh, observation, we celebrated the gospel. We celebrated the fact that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, took on humanity, lived a sinless life, and that sinless life now made it possible for him to die, not for his sins, but for ours. And the, and, and the juice uh, symbolizes the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ that was shed for us. By the way, shed, not spilled. Sorry. There's a difference. Uh, and, and, and so this is the gospel, but they didn't know it then. So Jesus is speaking, in effect, to people who really don't have a clue. And in fact, look at John the Baptist. Here he says, this is the one, this is the Messiah. And then he has to send his guys back when he's in jail saying, this does not bode well. Are, are you sure you're the one? Because somehow I'm getting mixed signals about that. The gospel was not clear at this point. What Jesus is going to do is to tell his disciples the message and the messengers that won't get them there. He is not going to tell them what the message is yet. But believe me, it is a good thing to know what won't save you because it will point you to that which will. Oh, the disciples. I want to talk for just a moment about the, uh, the Beatitudes. It's interesting to me when you look at those, I made a few observations regarding that uh, as soon as I find it in my notes. Uh, several observations. First, in the Beatitudes, there is absolutely no reference to the law. Get that? No reference to the law. Why? Because Jesus is going to say, law-keeping won't get you there. The Beatitudes tell us who is going to be in the kingdom. It doesn't tell us how they get there. But it certainly does not say they get there by keeping the law. <laughs> Here's another one. There's, there's little resemblance in the description that is given of the citizens of heaven and, and the crowds, the religious leaders, and even the disciples. I mean, think about it, folks. This is not Peter's bio. Uh, blessed are the peacemakers. Peter's the guy who carries heat. He's the guy that whacked off the servant's ear. There were two guys that said, here, Lord, we've got two swords. Peter and John aren't peacemakers, folks. They say to Jesus, hey, Jesus, you want I should wipe out this city by calling down fire on it? Oh, wonderful guys. What I'm saying is nobody really fits this. It's not what they do. It's who they are. But we don't know how they got that way yet. Interesting observation to me. Next, there's a glaring contrast between life now for the believer, the, the, the one who's going to enter heaven, life now and life then. See, the Jews had it in their heads that if you kept the law and you were rich and you lived the good life, that was simply confirmation of the good life you're going to have in heaven. Well, there was a guy in the Old Testament named, named Asaph who wrote Psalm 73, and he found out that wasn't quite right. There was something else. Asaph said in the beginning of Psalm 73, surely God is good to Israel. Surely God is good to those who keep his word. And then he looks around, he says, hey, wait a minute. They're driving the Porsches. They've got the Cadillac chariots. 
Uh, I'm driving a Volkswagen. What's going on? The wicked are doing better than I am. This isn't right. What he needs to realize is that in the midst of his suffering, God is drawing him close. But not only does he have the presence of God and the enjoyment of God now, he has the presence and enjoyment of God then. But don't make the false connection that the good life is somehow an assurance of God's great pleasure in you that means you're going to heaven. You won't see it here. What you see here is people who suffer in this life and, and, by the way, a great illustration of that is the rich man and Lazarus, right? Uh, the rich man, he's got it all. Lazarus has nothing. But Lazarus ends up in the bosom of Abraham. And, as I've already said before, this text in the Beatitudes tells us who will be in heaven. It doesn't tell us how they get there. Because the gospel's got to be played out. Jesus hadn't gone to the cross. All that hasn't happened. We'll get that in Acts. But it isn't said to us here. All right. With that sort of as a prelude, let's look at what Jesus actually says. 5, 17 through 20 is the bombshell. And, and I, as I read this text, these words come to my mind. Wait for it. Wait for it. I mean, it's coming. One time I was, I was speaking at a, an African-American banquet, and there was a lady out in the audience who, who resonated with everything I was saying. And right when I was getting to the big point, she goes, oh. And, and what she's saying is, it's coming. And I said, you are right. Here it is. That's what we see here. Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and so teaches others shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus endorses the law. He says, I am fully in support of the law. <laughs> the problem, of course, is what you interpret the law to be and how you interpret the law to be used. But he's saying... I fully endorse and support the law. It may look when I violate the Sabbath by the Jewish religious leader's eyes, by healing or doing these things, it may look like I've set the law aside. I have not. I'm fully in support of the law. The implications for that then come when he says, what that means is if one practices the law and teaches it, that's really critical. He doesn't just say, teaches it without practice or practice without teaching. He says, whoever practices it and teaches it, they're great in the kingdom. Whoever undermines it, I, I would say, maybe it's not a cool word, but whoever guts the law to where it has no teeth, whoever undermines, downplays, downgrades the law and teaches it, they will be least in the kingdom. So here's where this wait for it thing comes to my mind. It, it doesn't take a Rhodes Scholar to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Who is he talking about here? Practice and teach. Practice and teach. Who could that possibly be? <laughs> I'll bet the, the scribes and Pharisees are out there kind of sitting on the edge of their seats saying, I don't think this looks too good. And that's where the wait for it comes. And then he drops the bomb. Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Folks, you can dress it up any way you want. But it also means if you're not going to heaven, you're going to hell. <laughs> can you imagine that? Being, you know, as it were, kind of like the Pope. 
uh, in, in your realm, and all of a sudden, somebody says, you're not going there. And nobody who listens to you is going there either. That's, whew. I'll bet you those guys now are really on edge. And, and the crowds are looking around. And remember that, that the, the scribes and the Pharisees had their sort of, spies may not be the right word exactly, but they had people present watching Jesus and listening to Jesus, and as time went on, <clears throat> set to really make him look bad. They want to make Jesus and discredit him because of what he says. So here we go. Jesus is undergirding and, and standing uh, firmly on the law but making it clear that the way the scribes and the Pharisees handle the law will not get them to heaven or anybody who follows them. Now, that's going to take a little explanation. Well, <laughs> how do you, Jesus, how do you, how do you make this case? How can you possibly uh, say these things? How do you substantiate that? So what Jesus does now is to, is to say, and I'm really going to lean on this more in the next message than this one. It all comes down to hermeneutics. I know hermeneutics is a $15 word, uh, but all it means is how you handle scripture. And what he's saying is, you need to understand what I say in the light of how I deal with the law. And so then he goes into the explanation and he says, and that's why I chose to end after murder and adultery. Because things change after this, and I really want to focus on that next week. But here he gives his instruction related first to murder and, and then to adultery. He says, you have heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court, and whoever shall say to his brother, Raka, empty head, in effect, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever shall say, you fools, shall be guilty enough to go to fiery hell. If you thought Jesus wasn't saying that before, <laughs> he says it now. And then he says, if therefore you are presenting your offering at the altar and there remember your brother has something against you, Leave your offering there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother. Then come and present your offering. Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are with him on the way in order that your opponent may not deliver you to the judge and the judge to the officer and you be thrown in prison. Truly I say to you, you shall not come out of there until you have paid up the last cent. I did just a little bit of, of nosing around the internet on the relationship between anger and murder. I, I don't think it takes a genius to figure out that certainly a very large portion of murders take place because of anger. It, it's the venting of anger. And, and it could be anger that's long enough that you premeditate it. It may be anger enough that you just lose your cool. But anger and murder are really closely related. And what Jesus says is, the hard attitude of anger is murder in principle. When you're that angry, you are saying, I wish this person didn't exist. And if you've got a gun in your hand, you may in fact make that happen. It's interesting to me, all these mass killings we're in a society that's so angry, you're angry at people you don't even know. That, that just is unbelievable. But what Jesus does is say, see, I, I could see these guys sitting on their lawn chairs out there listening to Jesus on the plane. And, 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 and when it says, you shall not murder their sin, whew, oh, this is good. He's got one of my strong points. I haven't killed anybody. And, and they're, just, they're just thinking, oh, boy, I feel so good. And Jesus says, well, <laughs> don't do that. You better think about it for a minute. Because if you're angry, then you're already on your way to murder. You're guilty. 
You're guilty. That's what he says. That's not far enough. Jesus then presses on, and, and, and I know we could spend a lot of time on raka and whatever, but, but let's just put it this way. Jesus is saying, if you diminish the worth of another person or persons to the degree that you see them below you, and indeed, so far below you, the world would be better off without them. You're a killer. Now, we might say, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where do you think genocide comes from? Where do you think genocide originates? It originates from a mindset that says the world would be better off without this people. When you think about what's going on in the world today, I can't tell you how many uh, groups of people or in animosity with one another. I happened to be in, a, in an audience where Jimmy Carter was talking about his post-presidential ministry in reconciliation. I was amazed at the number of instances of war that were going on at that moment in time, and war had to include 10,000 deaths. This is going on all around, all around the world. This sense that the world would be better off without this group of people, this category of people. Well, if you're not uncomfortable yet, where do you think we're going with abortion? Have you noticed the vocabulary of abortion? A woman's health. Come on. Reproductive rights. And the words you use for that living being in the womb are subhuman. Subhuman. And therefore, the world can be better off without them. Why do you think so many abortions take place? Because people have concluded the world will be a better place without this human being. Are Jesus' words somehow remote, distant, unrelated to our life? They are not. I'm going to leave that. We'll move on to adultery. Jesus also says that it is wrong to commit adultery. This, too, by the way, is a commandment. After this, we're going to move away from commandments, as you'll see next week. You have heard it said that you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks on a woman to lust for her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out, throw it from you. For it is better for you that one of the parts of your body perish than your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you, for it is better for you that one of the parts of your body perish than for your whole body to go to hell. Well, we could talk about incidents of adultery and immorality, and those are certainly wrong. But I'll just cut to the chase. Don't you think this text has something to say about pornography? I mean, what? what? What clearer link can there be than habitual, uh, addictive pornography? And I'm going to tell you, churches are filled with people struggling with pornography. Not just the world at large, the church, and people in ministry are, are, are struggling with this issue. Now, <clears throat> that ought to mean that we, <laughs> we see a lot of one-eyed, one-handed people out there. How come we don't? Well, because I think we all know that, you know, if I plucked out my right eye, my left eye would step right up and say, let me help. Right? A right eye, it, it, by the way, I think it's the dominant eye, dominant hand. I'm not going to press this, but I'll let you ponder it. I don't think that eyes and hands are a thoughtless choice. I think eyes and hands are deeply involved in pornography. Having said that, you could cut 
members of your body off, and it isn't going to stop the problem that's in your head and your heart. So what do you do with that? Well, I think what Jesus is saying is, if, by the way, notice the word if, if this were to solve the problem, it would be worth doing. If cutting out, uh, cutting off a hand, plucking out an eye, were to prevent this kind of sin, then it would be worthwhile. It would be worth doing. We all know that that really doesn't solve the problem, but what it does say to us is this. This is a serious problem. Well, hell is, is in the offing here. Not only is it a serious problem, but if it is a serious problem, then it takes serious and dramatic action to deal with it. I hate to tell you, but in the, in the years that I have spent in ministry, I've gone to this text, and I've said to people who were dealing with sexual sin, you better look at this text, and you better understand it is so serious. You can't mealy-mouth your way through this. You can't take some little minimal action. You have to act dramatically to deal with it. All right, I'll tell you one example. Here's a guy who's living with a, 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 a woman that he's keeping in an apartment. His wife is, is still at odds with him. And, and I sit down with another elder with this guy, and I said, you have, to, you have to terminate this. You know what his response was? But I already paid next month's rent. That is not taking it seriously. So Jesus is saying, in all of this, you put your trust in law-keeping to get you to heaven. I've taken two of the commands, which are the clearest, and which you thought you were home free on, and I've shown you that every single person I'm talking to is a guilty sinner, condemned by the law. It's interesting to me that the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, by making themselves the experts, making themselves the teachers of the law, have now put themselves in a, in a position where they're the gatekeepers of heaven. And that's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 23. By the way, if you want to look at the follow-up of this in the Gospel of Matthew, Look at Matthew chapter 23, and you'll see he plays all of this out. But what I'm trying to say in this section of the, of the, of the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus begins by making it crystal clear that law-keeping cannot ever save. And that was the mantra of the Jewish scribes and Pharisees. And, and the sad part of it is people actually believed they were capable of doing it. Remember the, the, uh, the rich young ruler where he comes to Jesus and he says, you know, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, well, you know the commandments, don't you? And he names, by the way, among them, don't murder, don't commit adultery. What does the rich young ruler say to that? All these things I have kept from my youth. And yet even deep down in his soul, he knew that wasn't good enough. When you look at Paul in Philippians chapter 3, he talks about the, the warning of, of the, the, the false teaching of the Jewish religious leaders. And he says, oh, you know, if you want to talk about who has a, a, a merit card in Pharisaism, Put me at the top of the list. I was a superstar Pharisee. And in regard to the keeping of the law, I was faultless. What he means by that is, within the Pharisaical system, and by the rules and regulations and interpretations they give, I could keep the law. And what is he? I like the old King James Version, by the way, at this point. 
How do I look now at my law keeping? I look at it as dung in comparison with knowing Christ through faith. So this thing that is being perpetrated, Jesus throws down the gauntlet, as it were, and, and he says to the crowds and to the Pharisees, law-keeping will never do it. I've taken two simple commands, and I've shown you that every single one of you who thought you were guiltless is at heart and soul guilty. Law-keeping cannot save. Now, that's not the gospel, my friend. It's the beginning of the gospel. Remember when Jesus says to his disciples in John chapter 16, when the Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. <laughs> Law-keeping is not righteousness. You've got to keep that in your head. Law-keeping is not righteousness. I find it very interesting that earlier in the Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus appears before John the Baptist, and John protests and said, wait a minute, Jesus, you know, you need to baptize me. I don't need to baptize you. Jesus makes that enigmatic statement. He said, no, John, we need to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus did fulfill all righteousness. Yes, he fulfilled the law. That's low-level stuff. He fulfilled all righteousness, and that's what qualified him to be the Savior. No one else can ever do that, only Jesus. The law cannot save. Jesus alone can. They're not going to get that point at this moment in time. But what the disciples are hearing is this. Jesus had put a line in the sand between Jewish Pharisaism and all that went with it and the gospel. And the gospel begins with no one is saved by works. Jesus makes that interesting statement, especially you see it in Luke chapter 16, where the gospel, the Old Testament, the law and the prophets, uh, the law was taught until John the Baptist and he says, and now, since that point in time, men are trying to force their way into it. The law, as it had been taught throughout the Old Testament, was, <laughs> you failed. You failed again. You failed again. But the prophet said, someone is coming who will save men. And John the Baptist says, he's here. But people are still, still trying to force their way in. And they're saying, no, my works, my riches, my efforts are going to get me in. Well, folks, they're not. And that's the beginning of the gospel. So if you're here this morning and you, perchance, don't really get the gospel yet, you saw it played out symbolically at communion. It's Christ who came without sin. That's why there's no leaven in the, there better not be, <laughs> no leaven in the cracker, because he alone is sinless. He lived the perfect life, and because of that, he alone was qualified to make the sacrifice of his blood in your place. What you could never do, Jesus has done, apart from your good works and only through his. Father, we thank you for the Gospel of Matthew. Thank you for the way Jesus lays it on the line. When he said to the disciples, you need to be salt and light, this was a really salty message. He didn't hedge on the truth. Help us to see that, and as we think about this next week and the way in which Judaism twisted scripture help us to, to think about the ways in which that can be a threat and a danger to us as well.
In Jesus' name, amen.